like to um, welcome you all to uh, our next one in the series on uh, living as a family. And uh, this one's about educating for eternity. This is about education, education of children and families. Um, before we start, though, I uh, just want to remind you that we're all, we're just another family on the same process that every other family is in, working towards becoming more like Christ. And we've made lots of mistakes, and we're still making lots of mistakes, but the Lord is working with us just like he is everyone else. And so we're just praising the Lord for that. Um, let's open with, open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for the God who, who works with imperfect children of yours, Father, to make them into the people that you have designed them to be, Lord. We thank you for the way that you work in each one of our lives. And Lord, as we talk about educating our families for this world and for being with you in heaven and the new earth, Father, we pray that your spirit would come and speak to our hearts that we may learn from you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So I would like to tell you about my favorite, my favorite people um, people group, when I think of education and, and living as a family and just kind of following God's design, I think of one um, specific group of people. But before I um, let you know who these people are, I would like to um, share with you a, uh, a quote. It says, If primitive Christianity could enter the hearts of all who claim to believe the truth, it would bring to them new life and power. The people who are in darkness would then see the contrast between truth and error, between the teachings of God's word and the fables of superstition. You know, um, earlier this year, this quote and several others that talk about primitive Christianity kind of caught my, my, my eye, and I'm like, what is this primitive Christianity? Like, it's used in the Bible, it's used in uh, inspired writings, and, and, and other places, the Reformers used it. But what is primitive Christianity? Because whatever it is, it seems as though it's something that we need to return to, to be more in line with God's design. And that, that much I could figure out, but, but beyond that, it was kind of like, what is this? You know, um, it's interesting that when I, when I started looking into this, I found out that the reformers um, actually would talk back to a group of people who lived out primitive Christianity. Um, those people were known as the Vaudois, the Waldenses, the Valenses, the Waldensians. They were Christians who lived and died for God's word. These are like my, like for me, these are like the heroes that I can, top heroes I can think of. Like, I loved learning about these people for so many different reasons. Um, actually, the papal church says that they are the ones who carried the word of God through the first centuries um, after, after Jesus. And this is actually not the case. It's actually interesting. Um, most people actually think that the Waldenses showed up around um, 11 to 12th to 13th century. Uh, and um, this is actually not the case. The Waldensian, um, the people who were there, um, the people who came before them, their parents and grandparents actually all the way back, go all the way back to where they actually heard Paul's preaching. And this is where they got the, the Bible truth that they held all the way through the centuries. So what I really love about the um, Waldenses is the way that they lived even under harshest persecutions. Um, the lifestyle that they lived prepared them to be able to pay the highest price for the hope that they had in Jesus. Thousands of these people gave up their lives without regret. Um, it actually is said that those who remained alive after the rack and those who had never felt the rack were of the same commitment to living for the Jesus and never put letting down their faith. And this is this for me is like, wow, I can't imagine what they went through. But what was it that caused their families and their children and their grandchildren to be just as devoted to God 
down through centuries upon centuries. Actually, they went all the way into the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and uh, what was it that held these people to be devoted to God? And you know, this is where it gets down to today's topic, and this is education. The way these people educated their families is, is phenomenal. It's totally different than what the people, were, people of their day was doing, and, and it's totally different than people have done for the most part throughout history. These people actually would, they would go and they, under persecution, ended up having to flee from, from the valleys and move up into the mountains. And when they went up into the mountains, they raised their children. They, they worked, the parents worked with their children in many circumstances, and they were taught the Bible. Like, to the point where they memorized huge portions of the scriptures because they knew that at some point someone could come in, do a raid, kill a bunch of them, take all their Bibles away that they were making and transcribing, and they wouldn't have the Bible. And so, among their people, they had the entire Bible memorized. Not each person, uh, but some definitely did. And um, not only did they know the Bible, but they were educated for real, like, like serious education to where the young people were learning uh, Greek and Hebrew so that they could understand the, the, uh, the, the original manuscripts of the Bible so that they could be better pastors and teachers. And they were also getting education in the great outdoors. These are all things that worked to make these young people, and though they had no connection with the outside world, they really had never seen the serious evils that happened when they could send, when the parents ended up sending their kids out as missionaries, they could actually go into the colleges of the papal church, of the people that actually wanted to kill them, they could go in, not tell anyone who they were, actually learn some things that these, you know, that these colleges had to teach, and yet stay true to God. And this went generation after generation. And this is how, this is what I realized, this is part of primitive Christianity that, mis, that God is talking about here. Primitive Christianity is about the way that we live our lives as Christians and the way that we teach our children as Christians. And that is what allowed them to be faithful for generations and hold the Bible like no, no other people could. Good afternoon, everyone. Now we're going to fast forward to the days of the early Adventist pioneers. What's the difference between a principle and a precept? Anyone know? Or maybe we could say a principle and the application of a principle. Okay? Principles are things that we discover from God's word that are historically timeless. They were true from creation and they'll be true for eternity, like the Seventh-day Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, and so on, right? But a precept or an application of the principle can change from time to time depending on the circumstances, okay? Depending on the situation that we find ourselves in. But the principle, has we need to remain true to the principle, okay? So, in 1872, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had very few uh, Christian schools, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking for the next 10 minutes, and I don't know how I'm gonna do this in 10 minutes, but I actually did a, pro a research project on this when I took a course at the seminary, and I chose this because our children were being born, and I wanted to know, Lord, I know what the world is doing, but what is your ideal plan for educating our children? When should they start school? And so we had to spend at least 24 or 5 hours. I think it ended up taking me about 40. You know, if you, were, if you were to walk into the White Estate at Andrews University or in Maryland or various places around the world, you'll see all of these filing cabinets, okay? You know the big four-shelf filing cabinets? these long files and sure enough there was two big files about an inch and a half thick of all this correspondence that had come into the white estate asking the big question how old should our kids be when we put them in school and it was really cool to read through these sometimes it was a parent sometimes it was an educator at Ange University that really wanted to push beyond what uh, God had revealed through his messenger so it was interesting to read the feedback that the white estate sent to that individual especially so I'm going to look at a few statements. In, 18, 
In 1872, here was the first statement that Mrs. White wrote on this topic, okay? Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or ten years of age. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents, that's mom and dad, should open before them God's great book of nature. You know, the Bible is God's first book, but nature is his second book, right? God created everything around us, and we can learn an immense from it. She can lead their minds up to their creator and awaken in their young hearts a love for their heavenly father. And then I dot, dot, dot just means I skipped a few sentences. They squeeze it into this PowerPoint. The only schoolroom for children from 8 to 10 years of age should be in the open air amid the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery. And their only textbook should be the treasures of nature. These lessons imprinted upon the minds of young children and amid the pleasant, attractive scenes of nature will not be soon forgotten. 1872. Sometimes Mrs. White would give counsel to an individual based on the sixth situation that she was in, and I was one, he, was, he or she was in, and I was wondering, is this just counsel to one individual? That was 1872, health reformer. 13 years, uh, 18 years later, the same subject came up again. School entrance age. Do not send your little ones away to school too early. The mother should be careful how she trusts the molding of the infant mind to their other hands. Parents ought to be the best teachers of their children until they have reached 8 or 10 years of age. Their schoolroom should be the open air amid the flowers and birds and their textbook the treasures of nation, nature. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them God's great book of nature. These lessons given amid such surroundings will not soon be forgotten. Same as the one previously. Great pains should be taken to prepare the soil of the heart for the sower, capital S, that's Christ, or the Holy Spirit, to scatter the good seed. If, listen to this, if half of the time and labor that is now worse than wasted in following the fashions of the world were devoted to the cultivation of the minds of the children, to the formation of correct habits, a marked change would be apparent in families. So 1872, 1892, or 1890, sorry, 13 year, 18 years later. Thirteen years after that. Children should not be long confined within doors, nor should be required to apply themselves closely to the study until a good foundation has been laid for physical development. For the first eight or ten years of a child's life, the field of the garden is the best schoolroom. The mother the best teacher, and nature the best lesson book. Even when the child is old enough to attend school, his health should be regarded as of the greater importance than a knowledge of the books. He should be surrounded with the conditions most favorable to both physical and mental growth. So over a period of 31 year, years, this council just seemed to be being put forth in front of the church. Now, here's the kicker, okay? The question is, is this a principle or is it the application of a principle? How many of you would think it's a principle? <laughs> You're holding back a little bit. How many, okay, thank you. How many do you think it's an application of a principle? It's okay to be still wondering because I've been thinking about this a lot. It's okay. So let's figure out what it is, okay? If it's a principle, it's true in every situation from eternity past to eternity in the future, okay? If it's the application of a principle, there may be some times when it can't be applied. I would like to suggest to you that it's actually the second, okay? It's actually the application of a principle, and I'm going to show you more evidence to prove that. Because I open the Bible and I see Mother, Moses is, sorry, Mo Moses is taught at his mother's knee, Jesus is homeschooled, and so on, and you have all these examples in Scripture. It's like, well, it must be because we're in the modern world, and now we just put our kids in school. Lord, tell me what's going on here. Help me to understand. So I came to the conclusion after about... 30 or 40 hours of study, that that is God's ideal, plan A. Okay? Many who enter the marriage relation 
fail of realizing all of its sacred responsibilities that motherhood brings. And many are sadly lacking in disciplinary power. In many homes, there is but little discipline, and the children are allowed to do as they please. So, what does God do in that situation? Plan A is still there, but God is very wise, and he works with us where we're at, right? So, God says, all right, in that situation, the school should step in, sorry, the church should step in and provide a school for the younger children, younger than age 8 to 10. Those who are unable to train their children to write should never have assumed the responsibility of being parents. But because of their mistaken judgment, shall we make no effort to help our little ones to form right characters? Of course God doesn't want that, right? God desires us to deal with these problems sensibly. So, let me back up here for a second. So here's what happened. In the 1890s, yeah, in 1901 or 2 or 3, Willie White was down at the um, St. Helena Sanitarium in California. Mrs. White had come back from California, or sorry, from Australia. She was now living in California. And there was a, quite a nice sized sanitarium there. And some, in some situations, both the mother and the father worked at the sanitarium. And the kids were left at home unattended by the parents. And yet they had all this counsel saying eight to 10 years of age, eight to 10 years of age. So Willie, being one of the leaders in the church, he's like, mother. So he invites her. Sorry, I skipped that. He invites her to attend this school board meeting. And he says, mother, I would like you to share your thoughts with this school board. And not only that, I would like this council to be spread around so that other people can learn from it as well. Mrs. White listened, kind of analyzed the whole situation. She was such a practical lady, it's amazing to me. She said these words, and I'm paraphrasing. By the way, I, I wrote an eight-page research paper on this. I have a few copies. If anyone would like one, there's all kinds of details in there. But she basically said this. Would God not rather us have our school... Our, our children, our little ones, before age 8 to 10, under the care of a godly teacher in one of our schools, or would he rather have them running wild during the day with no one supervising them? That's pretty practical, right? So the end result was that St. Helena, that whole church system, there, or church situation there, they built a school so that the little ones could actually attend the Seventh-day Adventist school, Okay. And others learn from that, and that's why in lots of cases we have grade 1 through 12 or 1 through 8 or even sometimes kindergarten through 8. The question is, and the warning is, in many places, if you go through those files at the White Estate, they're a warning. That doesn't mean that the ideal still isn't valid. Okay? Um, have you noticed recently in the, in the media... You know, we want to get everybody back to work to the end of the COVID uh, pandemic. Moms, we need to get you back to work. We're going to provide maybe $10 a day uh, daycare so moms can get back to work. Have you noticed that? What a total contrast between the counsel that God has given us here. Okay? Between what our modern world is saying and what God has revealed to us. So the question is, what are the underlying principles in this situation, what, what did I learn from it? Number one, a child's mother is her first and best teacher. Was that true back in the days of Moses? Is it true today? Good. Number two, in 1872, there were no SDA schools. Therefore, the children needed to be taught at home until they were spiritually strong enough not to be led astray by the, quote, wickedness in the public schools. Now, that was 150 years ago. You think it's gotten better or worse? Number three, if parents do not have the capability to educate their little children and teach them to obey, then it is better for them to be in a school at an early age than wandering the streets without training or restraint. And I came up with six or seven basic principles, but the application of the principle is still the same. The ideal application of the principle is eight to ten years of age. But if for some reason that can't be met, then we should have our little ones in a Seventh-day Adventist school. Am I on time here? 
Yeah, okay. Okay. Now that Nate, Dad's talked about what age, like the age that children should start going to school, I'm gonna just look at a little bit of a different aspect. It's the aspect of what we allow our children to be exposed to. Um, so has any of you ever heard of the, okay. this is, hold on, this is slightly mixed. Yeah, okay, our PowerPoint was just slightly mixed up. Um, have any of you ever heard of the acronym GIGO? It is used by mathematicians and computer scientists. And when I looked up the definition, this is what, I, what it said. Garbage in, garbage out. The quality of output is determined by the quality of the input. Then it dawned on me that this exact principle can hold just as true to raising kids and for our own personal lives. Sometimes I've found in my own life that it's easy to not think through of the, the concept that whatever we allow in is going to come out in the long run. I believe that they are intricately connected. If someone allows their children to watch cartoons, movies, video games, you can't expect them when they get up from that acting mature or all the different aspects of that. For example, Parents are trying to get things done, and the kids are just underfoot, so they just take them to the living room, sit them down, let them watch a movie, play video games, or whatever the situation might be, and it seems innocent so that the parents can get more work done. But as they're getting their work done, the, the kids are watching all this stuff, and then when, the, when they're done watching whatever they were watching, they come back, and then they're all bickering at each other and all this, and I've seen this happen to um, dear parents before, is that the, parent, the kids, they're just bickering at each other, and then the parents are just like, why, why, quit bickering, guys, don't do that. But it doesn't seem like it dawns on us that that's what they just finished watching the thing on the device doing. So sometimes I feel like, it's easy for me at least, to not think through what we allow, our, what we allow ourselves to watch, that's what, we are, what will come out at the end. What are the long-term characteristics you are hoping for your children to have when they leave your home? Are you allowing only the things that would help to encourage these characteristics to enter your home? Do you want your children to be pure? I believe that's the desire of any well-meaning parent. And I, parent, and I challenge you, are you allowing into your home only movies that are full of impure things? that is just encouraging sensuality in your children? How can you expect your children to be pure-minded if they are watching movies filled with filth? The world has enough things for young people to have to guard their thoughts against. And we might think to ourselves, well, a few times watching or listening to these things, it won't hurt us. But we need to remember that what goes into our mind, we cannot erase. At some point, what we see and we hear moves from just being in our heads to being in our hearts. Let's look, oh, it's not on the screen, but Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And the same principle applies to spirituality in the family. If the parents have an average relationship with the Lord, then most likely, at best, your children are going to have an average relationship with the Lord. But if the parents are on fire for the Lord, then the children will automatically be, want a, to des, have a desire to have a deep relationship with the Lord. This is, I believe, the... the big thing that we need to remember. The things in which we allow our young people to spend time watching are the things that we are in essence hoping for them to become. What we allow our young people to spend time watching, is that what we want them to become? What are the things that your kids in, do in your home? Are they garbage in or is it holiness in? 
Because if the, it is the parent's responsibility before God to allow only the things into, only things into their home that will encourage their children towards the heavenly kingdom. Because in Jeremiah 13, 20, God asks, where is the flock that was given to you, your beautiful sheep? Do we keep at the forefronts of our minds that our children were given to us as a trust to raise our children or help to raise our grandchildren as a borrowed good to be trained by our wise improvements? When God asks, where is the flock that was given to you, your beautiful sheep? What will be our answer? Friends, we are in a war between Christ and Satan, and we need to be strategically teaching our children to be able to fight against the devil. There is no time in the Christian life for our own pleasure and happiness. Are we encouraging our children, our grandchildren, to be soldiers of the cross by the things that we allow them to see and hear? Or are we allowing the devil to distract them from the things that is really important in life? And if our children aren't walking with the Lord, if prayer, guys, prayer does amazing things. I know of people, and it happened with my dad's life. My grandmother prayed for him for almost 15 years before he came back to the Lord. But prayer works. One thing our parents had strived to do was to, to help increase our spirituality was to place role models in our life that would encourage us toward their greatest goal, that we fall in love with the Savior. What role models are we putting in your children's lives? Ever since we were very young, our parents have... One thing that really stands out that they placed in our home was your story hour. They invested a lot of money in it, but they believed it was a good investment. And especially my brothers, they were like, they're all over your story hour. I mean, I really enjoyed them, but they like really, really enjoyed them. So <laughs> um, it was very often they always went to bed listening to Bible stories. And we have the, they have the whole Bible series and the great, you know, great people of faith and everything that your story has. And because of that, the Bible characters have been major role models in our lives. Another thing that I've, our parents did was, when we were younger was that our parents invested in DVDs about creation science that would help to solidify our belief in creation and to not just solidify our belief in it but give us arguments to defend that belief. They deeply wanted their kids to be able to be educated on the subject, so when we were exposed to the idea of education, um, education, evolution, we would turn away from it with thinking it was nonsense and have arguments to defend our belief. Instead of our parents taking us to amusement parks and all this other stuff, we had the incredible blessing, because we were already in the States, we were able to go to like the Creation Museum and then eventually the Ark Encounter. And then they had purchased hundreds of dollars worth of DVDs from Answers in Genesis to help encourage us in our belief in creation. And one story to illustrate that it really does work, what we place in the lives of our children to listen to, it really does work, the end result. Um, if, when we lived in this district, we lived near New Glasgow, and my brother worked when he was like 12 or 13, I can't remember, we wanted to get animals, so dad and mom said, well, you guys are going to have to pay for your goats and chickens and build your own barn. So Nathan went to work for a beef farmer, and he worked there three hours a day, and he did everything from taking care of the cows to working with the chickens to really anything the farmer wanted. And one day, mom went to go pick Nathan up, and he ran to the car, and he's just like, mom, you won't, he's laughing. He's just like, you won't believe what Dan told me. And my mom was just like, well, get in and close the door. And anyway, so then Nathan goes on to say, and then he starts laughing, and mom starts laughing because he doesn't know why she's, he's laughing. And he said, well, you won't believe what happened. We were working, pouring concrete, and as we were walking together to the concrete, we looked, and there was a footprint of one of the chickens that had walked through the wet concrete. And he looked at it, and he said, did you know chickens evolved from dinosaurs? And Nathan just spun around and said, well, how did you account for that chickens have hollow bones and dinosaurs have solid bones? 
And the farmer was so caught off guard that this young person had an intelligent answer slash argument against what he believed that the farmer quickly changed the subject and got on to something else because he knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. But it just goes to, and the funniest thing was we had just finished watching a few days before a video about how the creationists were saying what evolutionists believe and how they believe that birds, dinosaurs evolved into birds and different arguments and one of the arguments was the hollow bones versus solid bones. So, and it reminded me that story, reminded me of the verse in second, First Peter, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, within you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they deframe you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. What role models are we placing, are you placing in your children's lives? Sometimes it is easy when we hear a good sermon or we hear different things, we're just like, oh, I need to like eliminate all these things from, our, from my life. But we need to remember that when we, God impresses on our minds to eliminate different things from our lives, we need to make sure that we replace it with the best things. Because when we, quote, clean our house of all the negative things and the bad things that God impresses on our hearts to eliminate, we don't want to leave the house swept and empty. We need to replace the negative with positive things so the negatives will come back even stronger. Let's look at the story in Luke. It was, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, and fun, finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. We need to give our children the best and guard them from all the rest. My parents didn't have the television and video games and motorbikes. There's lots of, just to name a few of the world's many, many distractions. But instead, we did things like building a barn so that we could have animals, family time, firewood, hiking, canoeing, reading time, gardening, etc. Just to name a few of the things. We need to be striving to give our children the very best so they don't have time to fret about the things they don't have. Let's give them the things not as what the world offers as the best, but the things will be a bless that will be a blessing here and prepare them for the world to come because those truly are the best things. We have to go back. Right? So, um, you know, Mrs. White talks about school entrance age being ideal at 8 to 10, but, you know, some people wonder, is that, why is that, you know, it, is that just randomly picked so that they get some good time in nature or something? No. It's scientifically proven, actually. Um, if you uh, listen to what uh, Joshua White, he does a lot of s study into science and studying the, the scientific studies that have come out, and actually, you know, there's a big push for learning to read when you're really young, but the science has shown that when you teach your child to read earlier than around the age of 8 to 10 to 12, what's actually happening is the part of their brain designed for reading has not yet developed, and so you learn, they're learning to read in the wrong part of their brain. And it never switches over. And so what actually happens is as these young people, the 4-year-olds can obviously read better than the 4-year-olds who haven't learned to read yet. And as they go, they get better, and the other ones don't. But as soon as they the ones who have allowed their brains, the parents who have allowed their children's brains to develop, as soon as it's, you know, within a short time, those ones who actually learn to read in the right part of their brain because it's developed, actually far by far past the rest of them in their reading abilities by the time they're older students. And, and it stays that way for the rest of their lives as far as the science shows. So it's, that part of the brain doesn't actually develop till 8 to 10. And so there's science to prove why, why God says, you know, that this is the ideal way. Another thing is, how do we know, you know, Dad read a quote about how 
are, we, the children need to be taught at home until they are ready, ready to face the moral destruction that's in the world. How do you know when your children are that, um, uh, that are ready? Well, I don't have a perfect answer for this, but I do know that public schools are actually saying, and this is public education, is actually saying that young people are actually not prepared to face the temptations that they're going to face on their phones until they're age 18. Age 18 before they're ready to face those temptations. And public schools are full of those temptations, not just on the phone, you know, but that phones are part of education, right? You're, you're giving them to your child for them to get their education the way they want to, and are your children ready for that yet? Well, if they're, you know, if the public school is saying they're not ready till age 18, then uh, they probably aren't. Um, and uh, it's not like that's a black and white number, but it just says that God designs young people's brains to grow and develop so that with time they may as they build their, their ability to make choices in life, they will eventually be able to make the right choice. But you can't expect, Eve made the wrong choice and she was a, made in God's image. She wasn't a baby. She made the, right, the wrong choice and she didn't have any previous negative effects. So we can't, it's not dissing on children to say that they're not able to make good, wise choices if they're exposed to it when they're young. It's, it's, just, it's just about protecting them from that. You know, God has chosen to use education to make and form children for eternity. God has been doing it ever since the beginning. He was educating Adam and Eve in the garden. He educated Moses for 40 years in the wilderness. He educated him at his mother's knee. He educated Abraham as he took him through life. And this is God's way of doing things. But for every solid way of doing things that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. And so what, what we must be sure of in, in our world is that we make sure that our children are not going to the counterfeit. And you know, um, when it comes to going to school, where should, you, you know, first of all, homeschooling, Dad read the quote, is, act, is best, it's far preferable. Um, uh, it says, uh, Adventist Home says, so fathers and mothers are so indifferent, so careless that they think it makes no difference whether their children attend a church school or a public school. We are in the world, they, they say, and we cannot get out of it. But parents, we can get a good way out of the world if we choose to do so. We can avoid seeing many of the evils. We can avoid hearing about much of the wickedness and crime that exists. You know, God's idea was homeschooling. That's the way it started. You know, but there, God also knows that, you know, some, some parents, like Dad was reading about, actually aren't prepared to do a lot of homeschooling throughout, say, the whole, you know, most of the teen years or whatever. And that's why God has brought up Adventist education. Amen? It's a huge blessing. And, and Adventist education is really a gift from the Lord. And um, so while homeschooling is the ideal, because God did it that way. God instated Adventist or Israelite education when he instated the schools of the prophets. You know, so we just, as we go through, as we go through life and decide making these decisions, let us pray that, that the decisions that we make are the best that is what God tells us to do. We must go to God for the answers. But in very, this may sound extreme, but I know so many young people who have gone to public school, and it is a miracle if they come back out of a full line of public school with their salvation. Now, they can get it afterwards, but public school is destroying young people, and it's not the teacher's fault because the teachers, many, we, we have many people who are teachers who God has called to work in the public school system to help the young people that are there. But the problem is that they are surrounded by other young people who are letting their lives go completely shipwrecked. And so our young people 
Public school is an absolute danger to them because of the young people, the peers that they will be around. They're spending much more time with the peers in public school than they are with the teachers. And even if there's solid Adventist teachers in there, they're going to be not going to be spending as much time with those teachers as they will with their peers. And there's horrible things that go on. And it is actually, it's law in our public schools, as we all know, to teach things that we don't want our children to be exposed to at very early ages. So God has given us homeschooling and God has given us Adventist education to, be the, to bless our homes so that our children can grow up to be servants of God. Um, I just wanted to talk about what are, what are some of the important things that, that teaching our children in our homes, no matter where the, our children are going, um, what are some of the core, core things that they need to be learning? Um, here, I'm just going to put up. Uh, Rebecca, will you come up and put up my slide, please? Um, just, I was reading in the book, um, Education, Christian, Christian education, oh, councils on education, and it, and this, um, it says in order for parents and teachers to do their work, they themselves must understand the way. If they're going to teach the children the way to walk, they need to understand the way themselves, um, in the way that they should go. This embraces more than merely having a knowledge of books. It takes in everything that is good, virtuous, righteous, and holy. Um, especially the idea, is, it can be very scary and intimidating. <gasps> what should I be teaching my children? And what about books? And, and I, I don't know all kinds of books or how to learn. Well, um, one of the, to take a deep breath and then say, what is it that I really want my young people to know? Well, first of all, most important, I want my child to love the Lord and to walk in his ways. And so there's a book um, called Laying Down the Rails. It's produced by simplycharlottemason.com. Um, Charlotte Mason is a type of homeschooling books, but that one of their research books is called Laying Down the Rails. And I really believe the author studied Ellen White. She grew up kind of in the same time frame, over would have overlapped I, the things, the beauty. But she has a program and she, she talks about, but we can do it ourselves. Our role is in our children's lives, if we want to reach the goal, you know, of having um, children that are solidly in the Lord, is you lay down rails, like a train rails, for them. And how do you do that? Well, she's, she talks about you can take and you take a character trait, whether it's patience, cleanliness, cheerfulness, temperance, calm tempers, respect. You work, you choose one thing, and as an individual, but better off if the whole family works on that character trait. And you, you work on it not just for a day, not just for a week, but you do it for two weeks. And every day, like sometime during the day, you talk about it, you read about it. Patience, what's the value of patience? You have your worships about it. You, you talk, you have your um, different times throughout the day. You talk about the value of patience. And it takes at least 21 days of repetition to become a habit. And so you work on, but about two months, setting it aside, and we've worked on that before you try working on any other one. Now you could do, let's try to have calm tempers and not have temper tantrums. You know, well, let's, you know, or let's work, let's work on respect. And then as a family, you work on respect for the next two months and have it as a, 
as a thing that everybody's working on together. And if you get set back, well, you just work on it longer. You start back over. And as you're working in your home, the, the Lord says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God wants us then to study, study the lives of our children and also the parents too, but look at the character traits and at the problems and try to get to the core root of the problem. And when you get to the core root of that, you look at it and say, oh, is this really, is this bad behavior from boredom? Is this bad behavior because they're feeling neglected? Is this bad behavior because um, they're, they're jealous? And then you try to find an opposite characteristic, and you overcome evil by trying to build those characteristics into your family. Um, so those are some ways um, to build God, uh, just principled family characteristics and get your children going in the right way. That's training them up in righteousness. Um, another thing is um, that a lot of times people ask me, I know here we only have one school that's for Adventist education. And um, I Oh, well, and then they started the daycare center in Moncton, and I'm so pleased for that. And I listened to um, our principal, and he said he'd love to see schools starting up all around. And um, I, I just pray about it in your homes. Pray for your children in your churches. And, um, but there's all kinds of edu Adventist education. Education, yes, there is homeschooling, and then there's homeschooling programs like PACES, that you can do them if you can't go to an Adventist school. But you can do them at home, and you can do modified homeschool, which is where groups, they do some of the things separately in their homes, but they get together for the core topics, like, I don't know how to teach math, but I want my kids to learn math get together and have a modified homeschool. Have them meet at the church, but have the different ones come together. And I'll teach this, you know, like for me, I'm good at science. My husband's good at math. You know, even in our homes, we divide up some of the topics, you know, that we work on teaching the children. But, and as it grows, um, you can do more and more of these things. It also becomes a good outreach because if you find I challenge you, if you really believe in having a strong Christian home, go visit some of your homeschoolers in the area, and you will find a lot of like-minded people. And go to the homeschooler um, conferences. Even if you don't homeschool, it gets you thinking and challenging and gives you things even to deal with issues at home. Just um, one other, just a couple of key points, though. Um, I find, yes, we're talking about Christian education, and a lot of people ask me about homeschooling and stuff. Um, I find, though, that in schools, they have to teach everybody kind of cookie-cutter education um, because they have so many children and everything. But when you work with them at home, they're very different, but they can finish their work a lot quicker, but you can let your child dig in to certain interests, and they can feel like a success. Just one example, I have, Nathan was about 14, and all he could think about was riding lawnmowers. Uh, wait, garden tractors. I hope I've learned something. It was a passion. I mean, it was just, he wanted John Deere, and oh dear, I should know all about this, because I finally gave up, and I was like, I want to teach you English, I want to teach you other things. All he wants to do is think about garden tractors, and he wants to figure out which one's the best. So I told him, go. Go study everything you possibly can about garden tractors, and then I want you to give me a report on it. And I tell you what, I learned so much but now he can get a job and work somewhere because anybody that has any question about anything about riding tra garden tractors, and I know 
I didn't learn it as well as I should have because he had to give me this report. And there are so many varieties. His younger brother can tell you all about it because he listened into his report too. Um, but now he can walk away and he felt good because he knew all about riding tractors and, and about the different sizes and the ways to fix them and the goods and the bads. And, um, but I'm just saying each child, if you let them have time to dig in to where God has given them their gifts, they can dig in really deep and they can feel like they're a success because they were given the time to, and challenged to go deep. Um, I, and some of this has to be from a necessity. There is times that, like, um, Nathan had a passion uh, to study true education. And now this was when he was in 11th grade, and I was like, oh, but I got to do speech and writing with you, and I got to do all this. And then I was like, Lord, what am I talking about? He wants to study something wholesome. So I was like, have at it. Read every book. He, he bought book after book. He studied it and studied it. But I said, okay, I want written sermons, and I want them to be grammarly correct. I wanted them typed up. I wanted to proofread them and everything. And then you are to preach them in every single church, and I want at least two sermons. You know, but, but you can be creative. You can adapt it. And the, the goals, you stop and think, oh, speech and writing. Okay, literature. Well, am I giving them good quality diligence? You think about kind of the goals and study your child, because Rebecca, I'll never have her study astronomy. She already told you that. But she will get in and she will study nutrition very deeply, and she's passionate about But now she wants to cook, teach others about how to cook vegan and to cook healthy for other people. You know, but you have time to dig in, let them use their God-given talents, dig in deep, and at a young age, work for the glory of God. And um, so those were some of my thoughts on just ways to educate in righteousness and give them a chance to be a success in their own self and in their own ways. You know, for me, you know, just every child is different but it's the beauty, they can become the beauty. If you focus on the beauty of their own God-given characters and not make them to be like everybody else or study like everybody else. You know, some uh, other things, I always love the practical things. And other things that are really good for, uh, especially sons to learn, um, welding, carpentry, these things like, these, ta these things that, you know, I'm thankfully, thankful to my dad and to other people and our friends of ours who have, who have taught me these different skills and, and even working here around the camp, I was able to learn all these different things that I'm going to be able to take with me for life and use in my life. And I, I can only say thank you to the people who, who are willing to teach me these things. These are all, this is education. Education is not just scholastic, but it's the whole person. And um, all these things are so useful. Mechanics, like... Um, I, I just recently got a car, and, and I need to know, you know, what happens, you know, there, what do I do when something breaks, you know, and, and because I've had the, my, I'm so thankful to the people who have taught me, I can actually do quite a few of these different things, practical skills that I'll use for the rest of my life, because that's what education's about, it's about training young people to be useful in this world and in the one to come. Um, just really want to, quickly want to mention, you know, Young people tend to leave um, our church between the ages of 18 and 22. That's when the greatest number leave. And, and there's people, people talk about it all the time. Why is this the case? And I want to suggest one thought. You know, I talk to so many young people, and what are you going to do after you're done high school? And they say, I'm going to go to college. Why? I don't know. Okay, well, college is, you know, it's, it's a good thing, you know, all these things. Why? Well, I'm, you know what? I'm going to try this, and if I don't like that, I'm going to switch, you know? You know, God has a mission for every young person. He's got a mission for their life. And, you know, if they don't, if they don't allow him to do plan A in his life, he's going to go to plan B. 
The reason I believe, a big part of the reason why so many young people are leaving our church is because instead of asking God how, what they are to do with their lives, they go to college and ask the people around them. They're there as an open book to college, or university, sorry. They go there as the open book to university asking the question, who am I and why am I here? Which is a question that only God has the authority to answer. And so when, when young people go to college to figure out, or a university to figure out who they are and what they're to do with their life, they have just walked on dangerous quicksand. Because if they start listening to those who are in college, who are the, the professors or the young people, their peers, they're not going to necessarily get inspired answers. And uh, even if they're going to Adventist, Adventist places, you know, they're not asking God, they're asking Adventists. And Adventists, we all are growing together. And only God knows what they're supposed to do with their life. And um, so, the, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with university. What, I'm, what I would like to just put out there is that beyond high school, God has a plan. He would love to share that plan, in most cases, with the young people even before they finish high school, at least the first part of it. But we should not go on in our education until we know what that God is calling us. He will lead every step of the way, and that's what I'm really thankful to the Lord for. And I, I'd like to just say two quick things before we sit down. Number one, I, we've said this before, but please, please do not put the Hamilton family up on a pedestal. We're still learning. We make mistakes every day, and we're still growing, and... If there's been anything in this for you today, praise God for that. Second thing I would like to mention, as I was working yesterday evening in the Pugwash Church, and I went into the office to print up uh, what I was writing, and I noticed the budget there for the church on the bulletin board. And I was so proud of the Pugwash Church. They had increased the amount that they were giving to Sandy Lake Academy since I left a few years ago. And those of you that have influence in your churches, maybe you're on the church board, Support Sandy Lake Academy and the little school that we have up in Moncton. You know, I, I understand we used to have 12 Adventist schools in the Maritimes. Now we have two. So let's encourage and support the two that we have. And maybe by God's grace, we can have more someday. Amen? And for those of you that have a lot of young people in your district, maybe...
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for every single home that's here and listening. Oh, Lord, each one is so precious. And Lord, you want each one of us to be there. Every home has their own challenges. Every child is different and learns differently and has God-given interests. And Lord, I just pray that each one of us as parents and that we will mold, guide, and direct and help each, each young person learn in their growth in the Lord. And Lord, I just pray that we will fight the devil every step of the way because he's trying to draw our children away, draw them any way he can. And so, Lord, I pray that we can have our minds focused on you. And Lord, bless our homes and save our children. In your holy name, amen. If there happens to be any of you who would like to see little bits of my favorites on materials, I brought some with me. Some people may want to take pictures of them and maybe check them out at home. So whether it's homeschooling, whether it's not homeschooling, just some materials to have, I have them there. Thank you. And yeah, thank you.
That's fine. It doesn't show too clear here, but it shows better over there. Right? Well, it's on all three now. Okay. Before. But you see it's a bit fuzzy? Well, it's, that's just the TV. So oh, okay. Fuzzy. But it's there on the screen. It should Perfect. be. They okay, focus. excellent. So. Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. Yep. Thank so you kindly. Just give it a good firm press. 100%. Microphone oh. for you if you like to wander or yeah. if you prefer to stay at the pulpit. I can wander around. Okay. So down. what we will do, I will give you that. Yeah. So the wires go, go now. Yep. The switch is turned off at the moment, so you get it it's on your belt. Well, no, the switch is actually on the bottom. So it will be right between the wires, so I just want to let you get it clipped on first. There you go. And then, tuck that. And then right here, I'll give you that on this side. And I will put the little clip on your collar. Good. And when you move your head, yeah. I suppose you might yeah. want to take the mask take off. off. Health Ministry component, I want to thank uh, Catherine and Tara for their kind invitation uh, to be here with you all, speak on today's subject. Uh, I hope that you've been enjoying each of the Health Ministry presentations that have been presented over the last few days, and tomorrow we're hoping to have a treat in store for you where we're going to come together and we'll share a little bit more, but you've got to come to find out what that surprise is. So we want you to come back tomorrow. So hope everyone is enjoying the camp meeting. If you're enjoying your camp meeting, just say amen or wave your hand. Okay, hope you're being blessed, informed, inspired, uh, and equipped with all this knowledge and information, but hopefully, most importantly, that you could apply it and it could make a difference in your life in a positive and a healthy way. Well, I'm honored to be here with you all. Uh, I have my mother and aunt with me at the back. So they're visiting first time to the Maritime, so we're going to welcome them as well. And uh, I know that we're few in number, but the, you know, the Bible that says where two or three are gathered together, the Lord is in the midst, and people are viewing online, streaming, and they will also have the benefit of going to the archives and viewing it again. So thank you. I know our time is limited. I'm 50 minutes in. I know we have a hard stop at 5. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer as we open uh, this segment of our program and our health feature for today. Let's pray together. Eternal God of hope and health, we thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the gift of life, the gift of health, the privilege to be here at Camp Pagwash, to be in the great outdoors, in the nature that you have created for us to bask in, to enjoy your presence and each other's company. We ask that you'll bless our health presentation. May it be informative, inspirational, and enlightening. May it give us not only food for thought, but we will be able to apply this knowledge and it will be able to transform our lives to better able to serve you and to serve others. Be in our midst, we pray, and bless our time together. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today's an exciting topic. Check it out. Are you seeing it to you, for your viewing pleasure to your, your right and left? You'll see it on the screen. Here it is. The most, one of the most important topics in life is food. Uh, I know you might be hungry thinking about supper. I want you to focus for the next half an hour, 40 minutes together. Food will be coming. And if you're in the cafeteria, you'll have your supper a bit later. But let's talk about food. Food and our moods the brain and gut connection. Big topic, popular topic, 
Um, many of you have probably read up on this, probably informed or at least aware of some of these things, but I want to share some cutting-edge research with you that is taking place in the medical research field in the body of literature. I like this caricature I'm going to share it with you. It says here, he, this gentleman, Klein, went to his doctor. He says, can you see it? Well, he says what? Um, you're hypernourished. Well, that's supposed to be a jerk, joke, right? And we're not making fun of anybody, but it's an interesting thing. A lot of people eat of food. Here's a question for you. How many of you eat to live or live to eat? How many of you eat to live? How many of you live to eat? <laughs> So sometimes it goes both ways, right? What we really should be, of course, uh, eating to live, but, uh, you know, sometimes we play with the pun, uh, live to eat. But, you know, when you look at a picture like this, what comes to mind? You know, this is the typical uh, fast-paced, you know, hurry in, you know, work in a hurry, life in a hurry, living life on the fast lane, okay, a donut, a scone, a croissant, a Timmy's run, Hot chocolate, coffee, whatever it is. This is what people are eating. And they're hoping, expecting to get good nutrition from this. Does this diet help our brain? Does it elevate our mood? What does it do for us? What's happening to us when we actually eat, though it tastes good and smells good? What is it doing for us? What internal mechanisms is taking place? What nutritional value can we derive from eating a diet like this? Well, you know, of course, if you eat something like this, you might feel a quick sugar rush. But very quickly, in 30 minutes to an hour, you'll experience what we call a burnout or crash. Your energy levels spike and it crashes. Why? Because this is loaded with sugar, hidden sugar, and that completely spikes your blood glucose levels, sends it out of whack, and your body has to quickly metabolize and, of course, get the pancreas stimulated to secrete uh, of course, the insulin, and et cetera, but it's not healthy sugars. And we know that the body thrives more in a healthier environment when it's more alkalized or alkaline. And high sugars produce a more acidic uh, body environment, which is not healthy for healthy cells to thrive in, right? And for the cell process or production to continue. Let's keep going. How about this? You ever have a, a child or grandson or grandchild like this? They're looking at the broccoli and the cauliflower. They don't want it. How many of you have a child problem with that? You know, I went, when, when, <clears throat> when, when I came into this world, my mom gave birth. You know, I had a healthy physical appetite. I still do. And food was never a problem. I was told that when I was four or five years old, I was eating a, an adult serving. I think my dad used to push a lot of food in my mouth because he always likes to see. You know how we like to see our children eat, right? We never like to see them, you know, nibble and eat crumbs. So I was eating at a very healthy... But look at this. You ever had this child? Ever see this? so typical, right? Child doesn't want their greens. They don't want their broccoli. They are just completely uh, giving you an attitude. What do you do with a child like this? Any suggestions? This is an interactive session, by the way. I'm not going to be talking <clears throat> monotonously and monotone. I want to get a little bit of feedback from you all, although we're few in number. But yes, what do you do? Any suggestions for this child, please? Yes, Kath. <laughs> okay. Very nice. So a little bit more palatable on the plate. So reduce, uh, good suggestion, Catherine, uh, reduce the amount of veggies, get them a few on there, and then put some other things there could attract them, some colorful fruit or something like that will complement the plate. Yes, you know, we first eat with our eyes, right? Isn't it true? We first eat with our eyes. And then it engages all of our senses, or our smell, our taste, uh, of course, touch and all of that. But our eyes, if the food doesn't look good, and someone tells you the food is the best in the house. And you look at it and you're like, this is, doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. But they, they're vouching for it. They're putting their life on the line. Would you trust their word over what you see with your eyes? Maybe you would. Maybe you give them the benefit of the doubt. But uh, this is what it is. So, you know, our mood depends on our foods, on the food that we eat. Did you know that? Hi, Pastor Michelle. See ya. 
Uh, you know, did you know that? Our moods depend on the foods we eat. How many of you had a great lunch? A great lunch. <laughs> a green lunch. Yeah, that's, that we need that too. A great lunch. Wonderful. Okay. You know why? So far, so good because I'm not seeing any of you fall asleep. This is actually a real condition. After you eat, you ever have the experience that you're fighting sleep? Why? You ever wonder why that happens? Well, it's what you eat, that's for sure, my sister. Uh, so, number one, what you eat, and number two, the food can be high in saturated fats, high in sodium, high in sugar. So, of course, you have a blood rush to your digestive organs, your stomach and the other digestive organs, the whole digestive system. But there is a condition. If we eat too much of one type of food and it's saturated something content-wise, then it's like sugar or fat or salt or sodium, as we refer to, then what we, there's a condition called postprandial syndrome. Postprandial then is when there's a blood rush to the system naturally, and then it's less blood in the brain. There is blood in the brain or we won't survive, but it must, of course, engage in the digestive process. And then as a result, of, we feel a little bit tired and sluggish. But depending on our food, if it's a more of what Catherine said, a more green diet, a green lunch, and the food is balanced, and you have, of course, the exposure to very uh, balanced vitamins, minerals, and a cross-section of um, nutrients, then, of course, you'll not suffer that type of condition as frequently. So let's keep going. So our food depends on the mood. So let's talk about this together. I want to share with you for the next uh, few minutes we have together. The first one is today, this is what we're going to learn together. The effect of certain foods on our mental health. Do you believe that certain foods can affect our mental health? Ladies and gentlemen, very, very critical. Second, what foods to choose for good mental health? How many of you would like to know that? That would be great. Tomorrow's topic, we're going to be talking about appetite. And so we'll touch a little bit more on that, um, I believe. And then thirdly, how to eat for good mental health. How to eat for good mental health. So let's look at this together. So we know what mental health is, more or less. You've heard definitions. You've read it. So I don't want to read this and sound like a broken and stuck re record or be redundant, but of course, mental health encompasses and comprises, of course, uh, all aspects of our health, and it, it is our overall well-being. So I like the last line especially, there is no health without mental health. You've heard that line before? It's very true. There is no health without mental health. If we do not have a balanced mental health or have a positive mental health, experience or a positive, experiencing more positive mental health, then it'll affect all aspects of our health. So we can almost say health begins in the mind. And we're going we're gonna to notice the link, the inextricable link to, of course, our spirituality and other aspects, our physical health, our emotional health, all are integrated. You cannot dichotomize any aspect of health because it's the whole person that we're dealing with. The whole person. God created us to be whole persons with a W, not with an H. Okay. See, there is a other side called a hoax of health that's being promoted. I'm not going to go down this road too far, but just, you know, there's this whole Eastern New Age type of movement, and they believe in holistic health, H-O-L, H. But with the H, it leaves you with a literal whole, but with God, it starts with W, Whole, he covers that whole, he completes that wholeness. So wholeness, okay? He wants wholeness for us, and that's really important. So let's talk about the effect of food uh, on our mental health. So the relationship between diet and physical health is clear in the body of literature. You cannot separate that. Secondly, there is a connection between food and mental health, which has been recently emerging in the uh, field of, of course, nutritional sciences, medical studies. And what we're seeing here is that food and brain connection is vital. I had the privilege of studying at Loma Linda and a few other schools, and it's been wonderful. Um, what I like about our school, Loma Linda, is they do a lot of food and nutritional-based studies, and it's linked to mental health and even spirituality. And um, some of this information I've gathered from uh, a cluster of uh, research studies to kind of synthesize it and in a more uh, digestible format for us today. So the first point on food and brain connection. Previously, research focused on single nutrients, 
such as magnesium, vitamin D, etc. But what we're seeing is that we can't just focus on single nutrients. We need more than that. So what we're looking at here is that we need to shift the focus to dietary patterns versus single nutrients and see health from a kind of holistic approach again, the whole pattern, the big picture, if you will. So let's continue to break that down together. Food and brain connection. What is that connection? That's the big question. Here it is. Let's begin. New and emerging research suggests dietary patterns are associated with mental health. There are three main areas that are impacted in terms of our mental health. Are you ready for them? The first one is inflammation. Food and mental health. So certain foods will induce inflammation. Number two, certain foods actually will increase oxidative stress. And thirdly, certain foods can affect brain, what we call neuroplasticity. Uh, it actually increases uh, substructure of the brain called the hippocampus. It increases hippocampal volume. So if there are certain foods that we ingest, that we eat, that are depleted from whole nutrients, it is going to actually increase inflammation in our bodies. You know, if you experience that pain and joint pain and all, and after you eat something, you go like, sorry, I don't want to pick on this, but growing up, you know, we all like to go to buffets and all that. So there's this popular place and they had it, I think, through our can. It's, Ma you know, Mandarin? And some people go, it's buffet all you can eat. It's great. It looks good with the eye. You eat it with your eyes. But you know what? Every time you eat that food, after an hour or two, you feel hungry again. Why? Well, some of you know the answer, right? So a lot of the foods, whenever you see food shining and you can see your reflection in it, you better be careful. So no, of course, because they put MSG in it. And MSG has about uh, 20, almost 20 different euphemisms, uh, different names, syn synonyms, as it were, for MSG. So when they say no MSG, they could be lying to you. It's a half-truth. It's a fabrication. Now, I'm not going off. I don't want to go off on a tangent because I really easily can. Because when you talk about food, I get excited because I love food. Let's ask my mother. She'll tell you. I love food. But I also like the study of food and understanding what, how the food impacts or affects us. Well, how do we derive those benefits? So, so that's the MSG. So when you eat that stuff, it leaves, you, it leaves you satiated temporarily. Why? Because it is not fully saturated or replete with nutrients. So that's the MSG part of it. The other part of it is that certain foods that have fillers, additives, or preservatives, and other uh, toxins or that have, may have be carcinogenic, they can actually promote inflammation. And subsequent to that, it promotes oxidative stress. That's actually what produces free radicals. As a result of that, it causes the abnormal proliferation of cells. So instead of the healthy sequence of cell production, it disrupts the normal cell production cycle, increases oxidative stress, which actually can now result in autoimmune conditions and also other chronic conditions such as cancer and other health conditions. So, and the last part is this, certain foods can actually um, reduce or attenuate brain plasticity. Did you know we are so wonderfully, the Bible says in Psalm 139, verse 14, we are what? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you know that at all ages and stages of our life, we can experience amazingly because of God's divine power, brain plasticity, neuroplasticity, where, you know, when you think, oh, I've learned in, or I learned enough, I can't learn or whatever. No, that's not true. We were meant to learn for a lifetime. By the way, when we get to heaven, we won't stop learning, Right? So it begins here on earth. So imagine certain foods will elevate your moods, will actually increase. There is a direct or causal relationship between food, mental health, and hippocampal volume. So if you increase hippocampal volume, you're increasing your neuroplasticity. In other words, you are ex exercising the brain. And we're going to talk about that uh, when we come down to the last few slides Subsequently, furthermore, we'll expand on that. So take a look at this, ladies and gentlemen, really quickly. I don't, can you see that on the screen? I'm coming back to my computer, not because I don't want to be close to you, it's just because this uh, screen here is a little bit fuzzy, and uh, I want to just make sure it's accurate information I'm sharing with you that you can, of course, view and verify on the screen. So check this out. 
the, to, to my left would probably be your right. You see the Western diet pattern? Do you see that? Western diet pattern it is high in what? Can someone talk to me? High in what? Fat, sugar, refined carbohydrates. What does it do? It increases the effects on the body. The second column title, effects on the body. It increases what? Inflammation. Increases oxidative stress. Decreases hippocampal volume. That's what I'm talking about, remember? And it's linked to reduced mental well-being. Wow. This is really powerful. And, you know, I don't have time today, but there's another presentation I give on the direct link with food, mental health, and our spiritual effect. We'll touch on it today. Because we only got one hour today. So I've got to definitely, have, we'll come again and we'll keep presenting it and keep sharing some very fascinating information with you. Let's look at now the diet pattern rich in vegetables, fruits, grains, and healthy fats. So that's what it does. It decreases what? Inflammation. It decreases oxidative stress and it increases hippocampal volume. And it's linked to improved mental well-being. How many of you want to have that type of diet? That's the type of diet I'm striving for. That's the type of diet we can have. If we make simple adjustments, simple dietary adjustments, we can do it. You know, every now and then, you know, someone's going to bake you a nice cake with, okay, and eggs and milk, and you're like, oh, but you know what? You might have it then once in a while. You might be doing a mission trip, like I've been on mission trips, and someone has baked something with egg or milk, and I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, legalistic at that moment. But I'm talking about overall lifestyle. I'm talking about your, the trend of your life, right? So this is interesting. Brain, the food and brain connection. So remember those three. If you don't remember anything, remember the three impacts on mental health. Inflammation, oxidative stress, and hippocampal volume or brain plasticity. Let's keep building our case together. So on this slide, what does it mean? Oops, too fast there. What does it mean? So the foods we eat... The foods we eat, ladies and gentlemen, can impact the state of our brain, our brain function, and our mental well-being. It's so true. So true. This morning I, had, I was talking to Catherine, I had some blueberries. I was talking, my mom was reminding me, did you have your walnuts today? She said, reminding me, my mom, you know. Mothers are always reminding their children. Yes, it's important to have the right foods because they are going to enhance and elevate your mood. So crucial. Please, look at this. What are Canadian teens eating? Look at this. Some of you have teenagers. Some of you know teenagers. It's, it is said that half of calories are coming from ultra-processed foods. Now, you know, Sister Cheryl, it's great to see you again. You mentioned something in your prayer, which is so powerful. You mentioned how the enemy, you know, you talk about, you know, the devil, say, you know, working against God's will, God's plan and purpose for His church and His children. One of those points of infiltration is the food industry. Enemy has so corrupted the food industry, so laced with chemicals, loaded with sugar, loaded with sodium, that we used to talk about processed foods. You remember processed or processed foods, however you want to pronounce it? Tomato, tomato. You remember, right? Now... We're living in a world where foods are not just processed, they're ultra-processed. What's the difference? Can someone help me out? I thought processed foods was bad enough. What's the difference? <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no food, no nutritional value. I mean, maybe less than 5% or negligible amounts. Anyone else? Can anyone help me? What is alt You remember processed foods? We heard really bad. How about ultra-processed foods? Foods that almost have zero nutritional value. That's what it's referring to, essentially. You read a label. How many of you like reading labels? This is something I learned. I like going to the store and reading labels. I used to, I go to my friends, say, why are you taking so long? You know, you know when you want to go buy something, you beeline it. So you, you know you need to get lettuce, tomatoes, uh, bag of potatoes. Great, okay. If you're in a rush, sure. But I, sometimes you, it's, important, not sometimes, it's important to read what you buy. And especially um, read it before you buy it and, and then, of course, before you put it in your mouth, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, so reading it. So when you see something like mangoes and you buy a pack of mangoes, well, unless you buy the raw, real mango, but you buy just dry mangoes and there's like five other ingredients. So you buy a food 
and it's just like 10 ingredients for a simple food that doesn't need 10 other ingredients, you know, you need to walk away from that. Why? Because the more ingredients tells you the increase in the processing capacity. So more of the ingredients, and we say EDTA and, and sodium diphosphate and diglycerides, and like, why do I need my food to be enhanced when God has made it wonderful? Now, if you want to enhance your food, yes, you could put a little bit of natural, you know, if you use Himalayan salt, you put a, you know, a little bit of Bragg's, whatever. But so much additives, preservatives, you need to stay away from that. What's happening? You may not be affected the first time you eat it. You may not be affected the second or third time you eat it. But after subsequent exposure, there's something called bioaccumulation in biology. The body, God has designed it, can take X amount of abuse. Some of us can take a little bit more than others because of capacity, bandwidth, or genetic predisposition or whatever. But after a certain time, the body says enough is enough. And that's why the body doesn't want to do it, but it turns on itself. That's why, hence, we come up with the term autoimmune condition. How did that happen? It could be, of course, there are times, and let me just make this straight, clear for the record, there are times when it might be a genetic inheritance, environmental uh, contaminant, environmental agent, and the things happen like that. And we're not to, you know, criticize and condemn anyone. But, there, but to a large extent, a lot of conditions that are developed is related to our diet and our lifestyle. Would you agree? Truth? So the question is, what can you and I do to turn that off? Well, the power of choice. And there's another emerging field in nutritional research and nutritional sciences called epigenetics. Have you heard of that? Epigenetics is where we have a gene that predisposes us to a certain health condition, to either a family history that we have diabetes, cancer, hypertension, etc. Did you know that by lifestyle and dietary intervention, we can actually shut off the gene? We can actually suppress that gene from being expressed just by the right food and lifestyle interventions and diet. Yes, God is amazing how God created us. And that's why it's important for us to share and learn from one another and be aware, be cognizant of what's happening out there, be informed. So, so important. So ultra-processed foods, would you believe it, are in soft drinks? I used to, you know, we all used to like drinking like pop and all that, but I don't drink any more pop. There was, you know, we all like, you know, people growing up, C+, plus, remember? Dr. Pepper, uh, Mountain Dew. Oh, man, that stuff is, ugh. And those of you from the Caribbean, there's other drinks, something, those from Jamaica, it's something called Ting. It's a grapefruit. And in Trinidad, we have something called Apple J. Those are customized. So very nice stuff. But, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So it's in juice, it's in soft drinks, it's in pops, it's in packaged breads, candies, sweets, all the biscuits, all the crackers that you eat. It's in fast food, sauces, spreads. It is laced in our food industry. I would say over 70% of our foods are ultra processed. Isn't that sad? Yeah. What is it doing to us? What is it doing to your, you? What is it doing to your family? What is it doing to our children? Do, what is it doing to our youth and teens? You notice, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but it's so, it's so easy to make applications. You notice how young children are growing up maybe before their time linked to this type of foods. Yes. So we have to ask ourselves these questions. We can make these changes, but we have to be aware of it. Let's keep building our case. So the big question is, what should we be eating? Thank you for all this information. What should we be eating? That's a big question. Someone says, do you want me to just be a rabbit and eat grass and, and green all the day? No, we're not saying that. You don't have to be a rabbit. There are wonderful options out there today. So overall, our diet pattern is very important, very crucial. Specifically, let's talk about it. increased intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds, foods rich in omega-3s. An example of that is a Mediterranean diet. Uh, we want to include, include here uh, the dark, what we call cruciferous uh, vegetables, 
like kale and spinach. We also want to include here, incorporate the root vegetables, which are very good. They are, of course, high in complex starches, such as sweet potatoes and yam and cassava. And, and of course, potatoes are good. You're, we're in potato country here, right? This maritime and pea. Yes, potatoes. Now, we do know, though, unfortunately, that a lot of our foods are being sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, and those can be carcinogenic. So we do have to, the good thing is that potatoes have a nice skin on it, and we've got to do a good wash, okay? We do a good wash. I asked a question to one of my professors at Loma Linda. He is perhaps one of the most foremost experts on soybeans. His, doctor, his name is Dr. Um, Messina, Messina. Have you heard of him? Dr. Messina. He's from Loma Linda. He has done um, numerous studies on soybean because people talk about soybean and say, oh, it's not healthy for you. It's been, of course, GMO, genetically modified and all that. This is what he said. And I love what he said because he came from a, a, a biblical perspective. And that is, he says, yes, it is true, number one, if we could avoid genetically modified foods, let's do all that we can to do that. And I'm paraphrasing here, by the way. I'm not quoting verbatim, but I'm giving the essence. I'm distilling the essence, uh, the gist of what he said. Number two, he says, even though foods like soybeans have been genetically modified, God has created uh, the internal properties of that bean with the husk and all that. Actually, there's still nutritional value in the soybean. So if you can avoid it, yes, please. If you can afford it, yes, please. If you cannot afford it, and this is what you get, is soya beans genetically modified better than, some will say, well, if soybeans are genetically modified, I might as well eat my steak and my beef. No. We're choosing the lesser of the, there you go. And if you pray over it, above all, God will bless it, and He will allow you to derive the nutrition, to absorb the nutrition for the body, okay? So just to give you a context, to give you a little uh, example of that. Then, Last point on this is what should we be eating? Um, decreased intake of processed and ultra-processed foods. You don't want that because it is damaging and destruction, destructive to the body. So look at this. I mean, this was, a, this was an interesting thing. So you see today, advertising, this box, this food, less salt, less sodium, um, zero trans fat. Now let me tell you something. When, when you see zero trans fat, that can be a misnomer. The food itself does not have trans fat, but when you eat it and it goes through the chemical process of digestion, it can create the trans fat because it has the ingredients that is going to convert it into a trans fat, especially if you look at the label and says it's high on saturated, insaturated fats. So you're looking for foods that are low to zero in saturated fats higher in monounsaturated, and higher in polyunsaturated fats. Because that is where you're going to benefit greatly nutritionally. But if you have foods that are loaded with saturated fats and loaded with sodium and sugar and all these other interesting additives, preserves that you see, certainly it's going to have a disrupting sequence in your body and also in your brain. By extension, our mental health, impacting our mental health. We'll skip this video. It was an interesting video, but I don't, wanna, I don't have time to share that video with you. So this was on Time Magazine. To eat or not to eat, that is the question. Well, it's debatable. Some, it's a controversial topic. Some people like eggs. It's a whole food. They eat the white of an eggs, etc. I'm not here to tell you what to eat, but what I am suggesting to you is sticking to, leaning toward, striving for a more plant-based Diet is the ideal for our brain, our body, for our mind, body, and entire being, our whole being. God created us for that. All right? So you are what you eat. How many of you agree with that? Yeah? I think about this. How many of you like the car that you're driving? You like the car you're driving? How many of you want to get a new time for a new car? <laughs> okay. Hopefully someone will bless you. Your husband or your wife will bless you with a new car. Okay, when you get a new car, what do they tell you first when you get a new car? Oh, you remember that. How many of you actually do that? 
They say, yes, please read your manual. Be familiar with the owner's manual found in your glove. How many of you act? You don't care about that. You drive out the car and you're like flashing. You're like, yeah, I got this. Now your windows are down. You got pumping that music. Yeah, you feel so great, right? You're not, and you forget about reading the owner's manual. The owner's manual is placed there. The owner's manual is placed there by the manufacturer who designed and who engineered that car, knowing how best to maintain it and prolong its life. Keep it in optimal condition. Well, how about us? The human body, even much more priceless, valuable than a vehicle, God has given us the owner's manual. And it is for us to take the best possible care of God's body, His temple. Why? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, Know you not that your body is what? The temple of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which you are not of yours, but of God's. And whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. So if our bodies, your body and my body is a temple of God, how should we treat it? Should we make it a, a second, second class decision? Should we throw it in the back? No, it is a priority. Now, someone's saying, well, it has nothing to do with salvation. Well, no, we're not saved by tofu and apples and tomatoes and cherries. And, no, but it, there is a sacred obligation, responsibility as children of God, bought with the precious blood of Jesus that we take care of the temple of God so God's Spirit can dwell within us. Now, of course, if someone is sick or someone is experiencing poor, it doesn't mean that God has departed from them. Not at all. Let's put that in context. But in as much as we can, as much as possible that God has given us the willpower, the drive, the desire, it is to take the best care of God's temple. And I want to do that. And you can start even later on. Say if you've lived a life where, hey, it's been uh, not the best care. Did you know that if you start doing that now, God, through God's healing power, He can restore. God could, I, I've known people who have smoked half of their lives. They quit smoking. They went on a plant-based diet. And their lives turned around. We just had a residential program in Ontario. Eight days, plant-based diet. Someone was overweight. They were obese. They were smoking. They had depression. Within four days, they stopped smoking cold turkey. They lost like 15. It's amazing. And they start liking the food. The first day, they didn't like it, of course. But let me tell you, it's amazing. The body has amazing ability to bounce back, to recover, because God has put those healing properties that to be activated, to activate certain bodily systems, to ensure that the healthy cells are produced when they are in the most favorable environment, and they're activated again so that it can take charge of the health. So what we eat is what we are. So here, really quickly on the screen, you can see what we call the proverbial wizard behind the curtain. The first box, the brain regulates activities we rarely give any thought or attention to. For example, our heartbeat, our respiration, uh, our, um, you know, our wakefulness, our sleep patterns, the brain regulates all of that. Then, following the arrow to the right, you'll see the brain also directs our thoughts, actions, emotions, and our basic drives. But if the brain is not in optimal function, what's going to be affected? Our drives, our emotions, our feelings. So you see, do you see the link? I'm trying to show you the link here. That's all I want to establish today, the connection. Food, brain, and mental health. Then if you follow the arrow, it says, it support, in support of this tremendous workload, the brain utilizes 20% of the entire energy supply from the body. How many percent? What's the percentage? 20%. 20% of the entire body supply. The brain needs it. And if it's not getting good energy, if it's getting depleted energy, if it's getting half of that, it's not going to function optimally. So food, see food as fuel, good fuel. You want to put the right fuel. That's another illustration I'll probably close with in a moment. And then finally, um, where does this energy supply come from? Here it is, from our diet. Okay, how many of you have heard of the SAD diet? This is called the standard American diet. There's also a mental health condition called SAD, seasonal affective disorder. I've known several people to have unfortunately developed that condition, SAD, seasonal affective disorder. But 
there's another sad, it's called the standard American diet. And the standard American diet is very sad. I mean, so forgive the pun. But here it is. I like what Michael Pollan says in his book, In Defense of Food. Michael Pollan, he says this. In the so-called Western diet, food has been replaced by nutrients and common sense by confusion. You hear that? Wow. So what is the typical standard American diet, sad diet? Well, in the last 75 years, we have moved from a primarily whole foods diet to one that's primarily based on processed foods and refined plants. Very sad. Subsequently, he says, the main features of this sad diet consists of lots of meat, processed food, lots of added fat, sugar, lots of everything except fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. There you have it. He's hitting the nail on the head. Let's keep going. Americans suffer with much higher rates of cancer. This also includes, I would say, statistics in Canada because we follow very closely behind the American health statistics and other statistics as well, or trends. So it's very similar. Heart disease increased diabetes, obesity, than people eating more than traditional diets. Traditional diet foods, um, your grandmother would have eaten whole, unprocessed, nutrient-dense foods have been consistently associated and significantly lower risk of mental health issues. You know, have you noticed the explosion of mental health issues in the last, say, even three years? And of course, certainly in the last two years during the pandemic. But what we've seen is that there's an inextricable link between our food that we eat, that we ingest, and mental health well-being or outcome. I like this quote by Anne Wigmore. She says, The food that you eat can either be the safest and the most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. How about that? Food for thought? Something to chew on. Which one is it for you? Which one will it be for you? Which one will it be for you? I'm going to speed up the process because time is running out. But here's a typical picture of what a sad diet looks like. It looks really nice, eh? Oh, boy. Oil dropping from those fries. You're eating and you get this grease all over. No, I'm sorry to say all these things. But I know we all had this at some point in our lives, right? But thank God that we can grow, that we can be more educated, that we can be more informed and make better choices, right? Here it is. We want to avoid that altogether. So essentially, what this slide is showing that 62% of the standard American diet consists of processed foods, sweets, and refined foods. That's what I really want to show you. And that's the yellow part of the pie graph. It's the yellow part, so 60%. And then the contrast is 2.5. You see that green part of the pie, that green slice of the pie? 2.5 is whole foods. So can you imagine? Less than 2.5%. We, there's no way the body and the brain can function or thrive in that environment. Impossible. So I'm going to speed through this here. Um, the brain on sugar. There's always more information. I always have more than less. That's just how it is. We always come prepared. But uh, definitely come back tomorrow. We'll touch some more. But just for the next few minutes, and I want to just leave a two, three minutes for some quick Q&A, and then we'll have you out of here. Brain on sugar. Essentially, this is talking about the fact that brain is, can you believe this, is is addictive as cocaine. Did you know that? Brain sugar is as addictive as cocaine. Higher sugar consumption is linked to lower IQ, increased anxiety, aggressive behavior, hyperactivity, depression, learning difficulties, fatigue, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Sugar. That's how noxious, that's how destructive, how harmful sugar is as addictive as cocaine. Uh, how about our brain, brains on trans fat? Well, the main point of this slide is that these what we call fake fats raise the risk for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and inflammation. Remember we talked about inflammation at the beginning? So really important, these trans fats, these fake fats that are hidden and are actually converted through a chemical process into trans fats. They are associated with depression, anxiety, memory problems, irritability, and aggression. And they're very hidden and laced in many of our foods. How about the brain on grain? I like that rhyme. You like that one? The brain on grain. Well, gluten, that's a big topic, and we can spend a whole hour on this, Catherine, on gluten. And I don't just touching, I'm just scratching the surface today, tip of the iceberg. 
maybe we'll say a little bit more tomorrow for our health forum there, but gluten-free isn't new fad. Gluten-free has been around. Now, naturally occurring, occurring gluten, it's like a protein in the grain, but what has happened today is that because the body has changed, they have actually made artificial gluten, and gluten acts as a filler. And they put this artificial gluten. Now, whole, like if you use whole grain gluten, some people cannot stomach it or digest it just because our bodies have changed. But back in back years, many years ago, it was okay, it was digestible. It has some nutritional value, but things have changed so much that people now are having gluten sensitive, gluten intolerant, and so now we have to avoid it because these artificial glutens cause inflammation, oxidative stress, etc. as we talked about, okay? It does, con however, gluten is important to know this, it contains significant amounts of glutamate. It's an excitotoxin, which is a substance that over excites and kills or damages brain cells. So, especially the, the uh, glutamate that's found in the artificial gluten containing this excitotoxin, this is what is destructive for our brain cells, for our neurons. So this is why it's important to try to avoid that and eat whole grains as much as possible and avoid all the, especially the artificial gluten. Um, nutritional neuroscience. Well, there's so much research taking place in neuroscience as it relates to nutrition. Very powerful link, ladies and gentlemen, and we cannot erase that. I'm gonna just quickly speed ahead to the last few slides here. Did you know that <laughs> we're often called fat heads? Sorry, no offense to anybody, but here it is. Human beings literally are fat heads, according to science, because the brain accounts for 60% of fat. Dry brain weight is actually 60% of fat. But what type of fat? It's DHA. So there are two most important things in what we call essential fatty acids, EFAs. So you have omega-3s, which are part of EPA. This is the, of course, special type of acid. I call it platonic acid, EPA. They're part of the essential fatty acids, and you have what you call doxyhexonic acid, which is DHA acid, which is, which is so critical. So the brain accounts for 60% of dry brain weight is based on fat, essential fatty acids, and without these essential fatty acids, the brain does not work. So we need, we need good fat, healthy fat. Where do we get that? Well, we're going to talk about it really briefly because my time is running out here. So I'm moving. Omega-3s. Well, omega-3s, of course, build cell membranes along with other, what we call fat, fat cells called phospholipids. So it's essential for the brain to thrive in that environment. And long story short is we need that for optimal brain functioning. And we get that from, of course, um, seeds such as sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds and nuts Walnuts, they often call walnut the king of nuts. You see, because the walnut is shaped like a what? Brain. So please do that. Of course, flax seed, chia seeds, um, they have omega-3s as well. People talk about fish. I know you're a maritimer, so I know maritime folks like to eat fish and seafood, of course. And yes, their fish does contain uh, omega-3s and uh, some other six and nine. And, but remember, we're living in a world where our water sources are not the same as they were 50 years and 100 years ago. They're contaminated. How many oil spills has this world seen already? The, war, the water has gone all over the world. So, you know, you know, everything, as they say, my professor used to say, common sense and moderation, right? But we can get, if you are on a, on a uh, convicted and uh, uh, <laughs> plant-based diet that you're, you're sticking to that, you can get a lot of these from other sources. Sea vegetables have a great source of omega-3s and 6. So, see, lichen, seaweed, have you had that? Very powerful. Very, very good for you. All right? So, we're wrapping this up here. Um, remember that. And omegas are very important for our moods. That's why we talked about the essential fatty acids in the brain. You want to include that. There's also a host of micronutrients that are very important. ACE, also known as the ACE vitamins, which are antioxidants, and other vitamins in the, its string. So very important. So you want to get foods that are high in certain things like zinc. During this pandemic, you've heard about zinc and the value of zinc. It's very important for certain metabolic processes, very important for brain nutrition, brain health. And it also helps in, of course, the synthesis of the omega-3s. Magnesium, it's 
called the relaxation mineral. Very important. That's linked closely with brain health. Vitamin C, as you know, an antioxidant. Very important. And uh, these are some sources that you can find the food in. But it's very important as an antioxidant to build our immunity and also help in our metabolism as well. Vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin. Get a lot of that as you stand out there, but not, you can't get too much exposure. You can also get that from a good supplement. Sea lichen has vitamin D3. Coal calciferol is also um, synthetically made, and you can get vegan capsules for that. Uh, vitamin D3, very important for bone health, for uh, liver health, and for metabolism of nutrients including, of course, our brain. But there's a very important, important, if you have a deficiency of this, this can also affect our brain functionality as well. So, we got over 100 trillion brain cells. They need to be nutrified. They need to be well-fueled. Um, someone says, feed your bugs. Your microbiome, that's your gut health. So you want to have a variety, a mixture of these greens. Um, the greens are very important. Cells, body cells, all cells actually love because greens and these plant-based diet, it actually feeds and it creates a more alkalized or alkaline environment in your body. And that's what you're really, really looking for. So my last two slides literally here. It says here, rules for eating. Michael Pollan, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Don't eat anything your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. Don't eat anything with more than five ingredients or ingredients you can't pronounce. Don't eat anything that won't eventually rot. Finally, shop the perimeter of the grocery store, stay out of the middle of the store, because you know what they try to do, right? They try to sell you stuff that you don't need. So really important here, right? So don't use yourself as a lab rat, ladies and gentlemen. You are not a guinea pig. Our bodies are the temple of God. So here are your tips that you take away. Tip number one, take a note of that, eat regular balanced meals. How about that? Number two, make whole or minimally processed foods that becomes the basis of your diet. Number three, develop practice and share cooking skills. How many of you cooked more during the pandemic? Yes? You cooked more? You bought less out? Good. Number four, make me time a priority. If food is our nutrition and our fuel, you got to make that a priority. What's our summary here? It's not what you eat that will kill you as much as what is eating you. Here's our capstone text. Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a person thinks in their heart, so is he or she. So we want to have, cultivate a healthy attitude, a positive attitude. And remember the vital necessity of what we put in to us, to our mouths, feed our brain, our body. It constitutes our entire well-being and better outcomes from mental health. So may we all eat to live. May we eat that it will honor and glorify God. May you enjoy what you eat. May you smile when you eat. May you experience peace and joy. And just remember that it is so important that we take care of God's temple because it's a sacred gift and responsibility from God. So I hope you've learned something today. We are looking forward to have you tomorrow, and we're going to have a nice treat for you. Uh, we'll probably have a nice health forum, but I'll let you come back and, and get that treat and surprise tomorrow. And as we get ready to close, any final quick questions or comments, or shall we close now and then have that after? What shall you suggest? Okay, well, let's have a prayer, and then if anyone wants to stay after the official recording that's ended, then you can talk uh, with me after. Let's pray together as we close our presentation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for creating us in your image and likeness. Thank you for the gift of health and life. And what a privilege it is to make healthy choices to best care for the temple that you have given us, our bodies, including our mind and our entire being. And I pray that you will empower each one to strive to make better choices, to improve our lifestyle um, practices and our dietary practices, that it will be in the best, uh, we can be in the best condition, mind, body, and spirit, fit to serve you and others, to experience optimal health and live for you. We thank you for blessing us now. Keep us all in good health, mind, body, and spirit. Watch over so we talk and meet again. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. He is our almighty healer, and he wants to heal us and restore us and make us whole again. Go forth and enjoy the rest of the day. We we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Right here, same place, same time.